There comes a time Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Yeovil Vineyard Church to our online service. I'm Karen. This is my husband, John. Hello. Welcome. If you're visiting us today, then you are especially welcome. And we really hope that you feel at home and comfortable with us this morning. So we're going to start our, our worship with about 20 minutes of singing. So please feel free to, to join in or just sit back and listen to the music. Uh, and then we'll bring a talk on the topic of the day, followed again by a worship song, so you can just reflect on what's been said. At the end, please don't rush away. There's all the information that you need to connect with us. As I said, if you are visiting, please um, keep those details and we'd love to hear from you. Salvation in your name, Jesus Christ. 
Yes, Lord, it is all about you. Our worship is to you, about you, for you. You're the center of our hearts, the center of our worship. You are so worthy of our love and praise and adoration. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for your love for us. Amen. Good morning, Church. Uh, whether you are joining us in person uh, or on our live platform or you're watching this later on YouTube, I just want to welcome you to another installment of our series on the book of Ephesians. You know, uh, it's good that we occasionally systematically teach through a book in the Bible or portions of Scripture because it forces us to focus on things that we would not normally focus on. Uh, today we are going to focus on Ephesians chapter 3. And in the outline that her morning gave us at the start of the series, uh, she said that this part, uh, chapter 3, was about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so before I dive into chapter 3, I want to share with you uh, a picture or two from Genesis 1 verse 2. Uh, so I'm going to read Genesis 1 verse 26 paraphrased. Then God said, Let us make humanity in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over creation. So it was God's intent uh, that uh, he would create a, a humanity out of the same substance and appearance of God and having the same shared purpose of God. And in verse 27 it goes on to say, that's exactly what God did. God created humanity and he created them male and female in his image. So in Genesis 2 uh, we read how uh, God took from the substance of the man and he created woman. We read in chapter 2 verse 24, uh, that, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and the two become one flesh. So the Bible begins with a humanity that is created in the image of God. So God takes of himself and he creates uh, Adam, and then he takes out of Adam and he creates Eve. And 
so there's this division going on, but essentially still of the same substance and the same image and the same purpose, completely one with God. Uh, now, that's a really beautiful image of marriage, isn't it? This mystical bond uh, in which two become one, representing a God becoming one with humanity and humanity becoming one with each other. So that is both a physical and a spiritual reality. So the origin of humanity flows from the substance and the likeness of God, who is one. And the blessing that is given to us uh, was to be one, to be equal, to be united, to be of one physical and one spiritual reality. Uh, but then sin entered the world, and what God so beautifully made became cursed. Um, that is the nature of sin. Sin separates. What God has made is all about unity, all about oneness uh, of purpose and of heart and of mind and of substance. And what sin does, it divides, it breaks apart, it separates. Uh, so that we find that the masculine and the feminine uh, no longer live in unity, no longer being of one substance, um, so that uh, the one seeks to control the other. Um, you know, we live in a world today where if I hold open a door for a lady or I let a lady walk in first, then I'm being sexist. Well, if that is your uh, opinion or your way of thinking, I just want to tell you that I don't, because, I don't do that because of who you are. I do that because of who I am. So God made everything to be one and sin came in and is busy separating everything. Now, if we fast forward to uh, Ephesians 3, uh, we keep that image in mind of this oneness and unity of God giving birth to a humanity that is of his same substance and of his same image. Uh, and uh, so we find that um, the, the picture that we begin with in Genesis is a picture of unifying or oneness and then sin separating everything. So we read in Ephesians 3 verse 1, the very beginning, Paul says, For this reason I, Paul. And so whenever you see uh, a therefore or a for this reason, so when we see a therefore, we say, what is it therefore? So obviously Paul has just said something and now he says, for that reason, for what I've just said, for that reason. Um, so in order for us to know what he's talking about, we have to look back at chapter 2 to see what it is that Paul said. What is he referring to? So Paul is speaking about the reconciliation of the Jew and the Gentile in Christ. Uh, so remember that at first humanity was separated from God because of sin. And then, you know, man and woman became separated. And then eventually, uh, you know, all of humanity became more and more split. Uh, so that even, you know, on, along racial and ethnic lines, we are split, we are separated. But then God came and he took a bunch of people uh, and he, the Jews, and he made them his people. He separated them out from the rest, and uh, he cornered, he fenced them off with strict laws and regulations. And he did this in order to create an environment in which Jesus could come. Now, what's really interesting is when you look at the 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 temple. Uh, in Jerusalem and the way that they worship there, you would find that uh, a Gentile, uh, so somebody that is not a Jew, would only be allowed to the outside. And then women could come into the 
uh, into the first court, and then only the men could go into the second court, and then only the uh, the priests could go further, and then only the high priest could go into the Holy, Holy, Holy of Holies once a year to make atonement for his sin and the sin of the nation. So you see these degrees of separation, and that is, uh, that is what sin does. Sin separates us from the presence of God. Um, so God put together this system of worship, these laws and these regulations, to keep himself holy but remain in the midst of his people. So he was, what he was doing is creating an environment into which Jesus could come and become our Savior. So now let's read from Ephesians 2 from verse 14 to 18. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. By setting aside in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to those who were far away and peace to those who are near, for through him, we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. This is a monumental scripture. So the role of the Jews was to be a light to the Gentiles. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, through the Jews, Jesus came and he became the light to the Gentiles. Now in him... Uh, hum humanity is reconciled into one new humanity. So whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, you become part of the new humanity. So there's no longer that racial and ethnic separation. There's no longer different nations. We are one new humanity. And in the physical body of Jesus on the cross, all humanity was united in the flesh and our sin was dealt with. So that separation, that uh, division that came uh, through sin was broken on the cross and we became unified into one new body and one new humanity as was God's original intent in the Garden of Eden. So Paul continues in verse 19 in the beginning, and he says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. So Paul completes this idea of uh, this image of humanity being built together into a temple in which God dwells by his spirit. And you see the language that he uses, you know, that we are not strangers or foreigners anymore, but we are now citizens. We are part of the kingdom of God. We are part of God's people. We're not second class. There is no class. We are all one. And we are members of his household. We are children of God. And so, as a man and a woman leave their parents and cleave to one another and, and form a new a physical and spiritual union, so too God and humanity have now come together in the person of Christ Jesus uh, and become physically and spiritually one. For this reason, Paul says, because of this one new humanity, and then he pauses and he talks about something else. Uh, he says, Ephesians 3 verse 1, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, hyphen, and, and then he stops. And then he talks about something else. And so what is going on there? So let me just introduce you to Hebraic thinking. You see, in the time of Paul, uh, one would often repeat a sentence at the start and the end of an idea to indicate 
that these are the boundary of the concept that you are communicating. So it's a bit like a sandwich. So you have two slices of bread, bread with a nice delicious filling in the middle. Uh, and it's not really about the bread, but it's about the filling. And so uh, for this reason then is the bread and then whatever is in between the two for this reasons, that's the filling. Um, and you'll see Ephesians 3 verse 1 begins with for this reason. And then look at uh, 3 verse 14. For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. So there we have it. Two for this reasons and something in the middle. So what is that central thought that Paul wants to communicate between these two slices of bread? And so Paul says that, um, shares that the work of the Spirit is to reveal this new humanity in Christ. And then Ephesians 3 verse 10 to 11, which is the key verse, he says, His intent was that now through the church the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to reveal the mystery of God's plan to humanity in the first instance, that in Christ we are unified into one new humanity in which God dwells by His Spirit. And then through this new humanity, this body of oneness, this church, to make known God's great wisdom and His plan to the powers and the principalities in the spiritual realm. So effectively we can say that the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to know Him and make Him known. That's to know Jesus and to make Jesus known. And for this reason, Paul says, I kneel before the Father in Ephesians 3 from verse 14 to 19. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. What an incredible scripture. So, for the reasons I have just specified, Paul says, i.e. the new humanity uh, in Christ and the revelation of God's great, uh, amazing plan that unifies not just God and humanity, but man and woman and unifies ethnic races, for this reason, I kneel before the Father, and here is my prayer, that the Holy Spirit may empower you to grasp how wide and deep and full is the love of Christ, so that you could be filled to the measure of all of Christ's fullness. How awesome is that? So not only is... Uh, is this one of the greatest prayers in scriptures for me, but it demonstrates the continuing ministry of the Holy Spirit to empower us to know Christ in ever-increasing measure. So what does that mean for us? The Holy Spirit has a ministry to know Christ and to make Him known. So the Holy Spirit builds unity 
and oneness between God and humanity and between us as humans. Uh, and what's more, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus. And so the Holy Spirit effectively is Christ in you. So therefore, the, the, the best response we can have to the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to partner with Him. Or we could say is to be Spirit-led. I have to say now, after 40 years of being a Christian, I've come to realize that uh, a Spirit-led Christian is the most dangerous and transformative presence on the planet. Um, so dangerous, in fact, that the enemy uh, devotes all his time to testing and tempting and trying to distract us into other things. You know, think about your life. The harder we work, the less we pray. The less time we have, the less time we spend with God. The greater my worries and my fears are, the less time I sit and listen to or follow the Spirit. So we are, we are most like that seed that falls between the weeds and the thorns. And as it grows up, it is slowly strangled until it dies spiritually. So what can we do about that? I want to conclude with a really simple, simple thought. You know, there's only one reason the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. The rich pay themselves first and the poor have to pay others first. So in your faith, be rich. If you want to grow in your faith, you have to pay yourself first. Don't pay your job first. Don't pay money first. Don't pay your friends first. Don't pay your entertainment first. None of those things will well up to eternal life. Pay yourself by giving your time to the Holy Spirit. The more you give to the Holy Spirit, the more He will know you and make you known to Jesus. And the more He will know Jesus and make Jesus known to you. You will both know and be known if you pay yourself first with your time, your energy, your money. This is the one thing I believe truly that we should be very, very selfish. That our time belongs to God first. Matthew 7 verse 21 to 23, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. So you see, it, it doesn't matter how much you go to church. It doesn't matter how much good works you do. It doesn't matter how good your intentions are. We can't be pretend Christians. The only thing that matters is whether you know Him and He knows you. We have to know Him and the way that we get to know Him is to, to, to leave these things of the world and to cleave to the Spirit who is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, I just want to thank you this morning for your ministry. And we just want to say yes, Lord. We say yes to your ministry. Show us Jesus. 
Reveal Jesus to us. Search our hearts and, and show Jesus who we are. You are Christ in us. And we welcome you. And we give you our time. We give you our hearts. And we say, yes, Lord. We want to know you and we want to be known by you. Have your way with us. If you are watching this this morning and you are not a Christian, uh, you've not encountered Jesus, you've not given your life to him, I just want to invite you to do so. It is the most important decision that you will ever make in your life. It will take you from living a pointless, a futile life, to living a life with eternal blessing and an incredible future that awaits you. And one thing I can tell you for certain, the more you know Him and the more you are known by Him, the more you will be transformed into His image and His likeness and the more you will experience the blessing of the Father. The love, this incredible love that is in Christ for you for now. We don't have to wait until sometime in the future uh, or when we're on our deathbed. You can know him now and your life can change now. So I just want to invite you to, to accept Jesus into your life. And the Holy Spirit will come and make his home with you. And lead and guide you into all truth. And he will reveal more of Christ to you. And he will make sure that Christ knows all about you. Come Holy Spirit. And for whoever responds now, we just pray that you will meet them powerfully where they are. Let your kingdom come. Amen. Take the world, but give me Jesus. All its joys are but a name. Blood is love, abideth ever through eternal years the same. Oh, the heart and depth of mercy. Oh, the Can ever tell the gold. 
parchment made where every stop 